All right, this video is over expected values, the binomial model, and the normal model. All right, first off, um, we're going to start off the video talk and focus on the binomial model. Now, remember, for the binomial model, it's got to be what we call a Bernoulli trial. Remember, the Bernoulli trials is you have to have success P and failure Q. Those are the only two options, just two different outcomes, success and failure. There's not three or four or five different outcomes. And we have to make sure that that success P is, is stays constant. Okay, which means that it doesn't change or that the, you know, we got to make sure we have independence. Constant, okay, a little spelling error there. So anyway, again, we got to make sure that it stays independent. So what happens on one event does not affect, or one trial does not affect the next trial. All right, so what we want to do is I want to start off with um, something really easy so we can and we can learn about this new phrase, expected values. Let's think about Bailey again. Remember Bailey's um, shooting free throws. Here's the hoop, right? Okay. And um, here she is right here. She's got the basketball in her hand, and she's shooting a free throw, and she's hoping that the ball goes right into the hoop. All right, so... Let's remember, though, we said that the probability of success for her to make any free throw was 80%, and that the each free throw attempt that she makes is independent of the next, meaning one outcome is not going to affect the next. So if we did binomial, remember binomial means we're looking for how many successes in a certain number of trials. Let's say she shoots, uh, shoots 10 free throws. Okay? Now, if we think about how many different things that could happen when she shoots 10 free throws, you know, this is what we consider a random variable. Um, her making it or missing, it's random. So how many shots she makes of 10 free throws is a random variable. So we call it X. A capital X represents the random variable. And she, and again, the random variable here is how many shots that she makes in 10 free throws. So she could make no, she could make none, she could miss them all. She can make two, one, two, excuse me, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or she could make all 10. Now, a probability model lists all the different outcomes that can happen. Again, she's shooting 10 free throws, and we're trying to find out how many she makes. So the random variable is how many free throws she makes. And again, could be any one of these options. Now, right next to it, we need the probability. So this would be the probability of that random variable. So now, what is this big X, little x? Well, little x is the each individual outcome. Big X represents the idea of how many she makes. Little x is the different outcomes, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So anyway, we learned in the last video that if I want to find out the probability of her making zero free throws, that would be 10 shots, choose none of them to be made. So that would be um, 0.8 to the 0, no successes. 0.2 to the 10th, all straight failures. And then we can continue on here. So the next one would be 10 shots, choose one to make, and then 0.8, one success, and then 0.29, nine failures. And we can continue that on. Obviously, that would probably take a while here. I don't know if we'd want to actually go and sit and do all that. That would take quite a few calculations on the calculator to do. But the key question here is how many... Out of 10, do we expect, keyword expect, not meaning she's going to, what's an expectation, how many we expect her to make? Now, honestly, the, the answer to this question should be, duh, I hope everybody right now is thinking, well, if she shoots 80%, she should make 80 Eight, right? That's simple. 80%, 8 out of 10, she should make 8 out of 10 free throws. So you think, I mean, you could think of this word expect as like a mean, right? It's how many we expect to happen. The average, is the average going to happen? No, it's just simply what we expect. So here's the symbol we use for expected values. It's the mu. Remember, that's our symbol for mean because an expected value is a lot like a mean. And we say the mean of x, meaning, remember, x is how many she's going to make could be many different things, right? It's a random variable. We don't know how many she's going to make. could be 0 through 10. But we expect her, or we expect the mean of many, many trials to be 8. Now, the, the thinking behind this is, 
is if Bailey did this scenario, shoots 10 free throws over and over and over again, sometimes she'll make 10, sometimes she'll make 7, sometimes she'll make 5, sometimes she'll make 6, sometimes she'll make 8, sometimes she'll make 2, whatever. She does it over and over again. Over the course of the long run, we would expect her to have an average of 8 shots made out of 10. I mean, that's what she shoots, 80%. So the formula for the expected values is simply how many out, how many um, trials you're going to do times P. So think about that. For Bailey, that was 80% times 10, 8, right? But think about that. If we have a mean, we also have a standard deviation. We know that she's not going to shoot 8 every single time. That number could deviate. So we have sigma, standard deviation, of that random variable. And the formula for this is the square root of NPQ. So for Bailey here, that's going to be 10 shots, 80% success, 20% failure. So I'm going to get out my calculator here. That'd be the square root of 10 times 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 0.2 is 1.26. So again, we expect her to make 8 shots, but we know that that's going to vary. How much is it going to vary by? Oh, the standard deviation, 1.26. So I'm going to come back up here, and I want to make a couple notes here. This is only for binomial, by the way. The expected outcome, right, the expected outcome is n times p. Remember, binomials, how many out of? So she's going to shoot 10 free throws. How many of them do we expect her to make times it by the probability of success? But with that is a standard deviation because we know that that's not always going to happen. It's going to deviate, and that's the square root of n p. Q. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense, and, and, and really it should, okay? So if, you know, I say Betty's going to shoot 10 free throws, how many do you think she's going to make? Well, I bet she makes to 8, I mean 80%, right? But is she going to? No, it's going to deviate by 1.26. So what that means is down low here, 0, 1, 2, those are probably going to be very low probability because she shoots 80%. She shouldn't only make 0 or 1. I mean, come on, she's better than that. So she should, this, the probability is around 6, 7, 8, 9, should be a little bit stronger. What about the probability of 10? Well, it's probably going to be kind of low as well, again, because she only shoots 80%, so we don't really expect her to make 10. So hopefully that all makes sense. Hopefully those formulas make sense as well. All right, let's look at a little bit more of an advanced problem. We're going to look at this problem in two ways to help us draw a connection between the binomial and normal model. All right, it is known that 6% of passengers fail to show up for their flights. Airlines know this, so they overbook flights and see more, and excuse me, that's supposed to be a sell, and they sell more tickets than seats because they expect people to not show. The problem occurs in the event that everyone does show and people have to get bummed to their flights. So the airlines know that, you know, not everybody's going to show up for the flights. So what that happens is they sell more tickets than seats because they know, hey, if people don't show, then we're fine. Um, so the problem occurs if everybody that buys a ticket shows up, then all of a sudden they're going to have to bump some people out. So let's consider a very small airplane. So this makes a little bit more sense to us. Ten seats in the airplane. The airline's going to sell 12 tickets. 12 tickets. So that means 12 people have a ticket. So we want to know what's the probability that they do not have enough seats. So this is going to be a random variable x. Okay, remember a random variable is what what's going to happen that's going to you know you know what's going to have to occur for my question to be answered well if one person shows up got enough seats two three four five six seven eight nine people show up got enough seats if 10 people show up i have enough seats if 11 people show up i don't have enough seats and that's what i'm asking for that's the question i'm looking for if 12 people show up i don't have enough seats and i only sold 12 tickets so if 11 or 12 people show up I don't have enough seats. So I have to find the probability that not enough seats are sold is um, equal to these individual events of 11 or 12. So let's really sit and think this through. So let's come back up here real quick. The probability that people don't show up is 0.06. That's don't show, right? That means the probability that somebody doesn't make the flight is 0.06. That leaves us, well, I'm going to have to skip space on the from up there. That leaves us with a 94% chance that they do show, okay? So, if 11 people do show, I'm in prob. I have a problem. I do not have enough seats. So, that's going to be 12 tickets sold, 11 people show up. 
That's 0 0.94 to the 11. 11 people showed. Remember, 94 was the probability that somebody does show up. And then that would mean one person did not show. One person did not show. The other option would be 12 tickets are sold and all 12 people choose to show up. That's everybody shows. All 12 people show. The probability of showing is 0.94. And absolutely nobody fails to show. If these two events occur, this is when I run into a problem. So I'm going to go to my calculator here. I'm going to bring the calculator up so you guys can see how to do this one more time. Okay, I'm going to do 12 uh, math. Slide over to PRB. Number 3 there, NCR. So 12, choose 11. And that is 12. So there's 12 different ways that can happen. So I'm going to do 12 times 0.94 raised to the 11th times 0.06. I really don't need to be typing, but anyway, I know what that is. But anyway, 0.06 raised to the first, and I get 0 0.3645. 0 0.3645. So let me write that down over here. 0 0.3645. Okay, now the next one I'm going to do as well, I'm going to do this next one as well. So 12, choose 12. You really shouldn't have to, um, you should know that there's only one way for that to happen. And that's everybody shows. There should be only one way for that to happen, 12, choose 12. But just to prove it to you, it does there. So I'm going to do 1 times 0.94 raised to the 12th. I'm not even going to type in the 0.06 to 0 because I know that that's 1. And I get 0 0.4759, 0 0.4759. 0.4759. I hope I typed all that in right. Just want to double check real quick. 0.94. Yep. So now these are the two cases where I don't have enough seats. 11 people show, 12 people show. Just found the probability. So let me add those together. 0.3645 plus 0.4759, and I get that the total probability of people not showing is 0.8. 404. I said that wrong. I'm sorry. The probability that I do not have enough seats is 84%. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, that's awfully high. You're right. And I made this example on purpose because we're going to understand it really good with expected values. So think about this real quick. They either show or they don't show. So this is Bernoulli. Show or don't show. The probability that somebody shows is 6%. It's not going to change. It's independent. So how many people do I expect to show up? Well, if I sell 12 tickets and I expect 94% of those people to show up. So how many people, how many do I expect to show up? 12 times 0.94 is 11.28. So think about that for one second. With 94% of people showing up, I expect 11.28 people to show. That's more than the seats I have. I only have 10 seats. So obviously, I, I expect to not have enough seats. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm selling 10 seats. 12, I'm, I'm, I only have 10 seats, I'm selling 12 tickets, I expect 11.28 people to show up, that means, honestly, a lot of the time, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm not going to have enough seats, which is why 84% is so high. So hopefully that whole problem makes sense to you. And now we're going to do the problem a second time here, a little different scenario, where more, hope, you know, kind of more things come together here. Let's consider a bigger airplane, an airplane that has 300 seats. Okay, much bigger, and we sell 310 tickets. What's the probability they don't have enough seats? Well, if 300 people show up, I have just enough seats. The problem occurs if 301 people show up, 302, <coughs> excuse me, 303, 304, 305, 306 people show up, 307 people, 308, 309, or if all 310 people that I sold tickets to show up, I'm in trouble. So I'm going to have to go through and actually find the probability of every single one of these accounts. So I'm going to have to do 310 tickets, 301 show up. That is 0.94 to the 301, 301 people show up, times 0.06 to the 9 people that don't show. Now, I'm going to have to continue that for all these. Uh, excuse me. I don't want to do that, and I don't expect you to want to do that either. That's a lot of calculations. So I can actually use the normal model to help me out. Now, hear me out on this. How many people do I expect to show up? 
Well, if I sell 310 tickets and I expect 94% of them to show up, that would be 310 times 0.94. That's 291.4. Now, with a bigger airplane, this should make a lot more sense why airlines actually overbook their flights. They only expect 291.4 people to show up. They have 300 seats. So that gives them a, a decent cushion, about a, a, approximately nine people cushion, where they're going to be fine. Again, they, don't, they, ex, they expect only 94% of these 310 people to show up. They got plenty. Plenty of seats to ha not have to worry about this. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Seeing the other airplanes much smaller, so it was a little bit different. Now, of course, this is going to deviate. You know, it's not always going to be 291.4 people. It's going to deviate. So let me figure out the standard deviation here. So that'd be 310 tickets. Success is 0.94. Failure 0.06. So that's the square root of 310 times 0.94 times 0.06 is 4.18. So I am going to deviate by about 4.18 people. Now, I can use the normal model. Think about this here. Ready? Here's the normal model now. Ready? The normal model, beautiful as ever. Right smack dab in the middle is the mean. In terms of these problems, we're talking about what we expect to happen. We expect 291.4 people. We're going to go up one, two, three standard deviations. Down one, two, three standard deviations. All right. So we run into a problem when we have 300 or more than 300 people show up. So I got to figure out where does 300 fall on the normal model. So I could use a z-score, right? 300 minus what I expect, 291.4 divided by the standard deviation, 4.18. So I get 300 minus 291.4 divided by 4.18 gives me a z-score of 2.0574. Okay. So now what happens is, here's, here's plus 1 right here. Right. Let me get a different color here so we could show this. Here's plus 2. So it's a little bit bigger than 2. So about right here is where we have... 300 people. More than that, if more than 300 show, I'm in trouble. Notice that's very small here. In the previous problem, we had a much smaller airplane, so our expectations were different. So now, how can I find the percentage of people that, how can I find the percentage of time that's going to be more than 300? Hey, normal CDF. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my normal CDF on my calculator. And I'm going to go from 2.0574 to 99. So I'm going to look above 300 people, and I get 0.0198. So there's a 0.0198% chance that I don't have enough seats. Much smaller than the previous problem. Again, I only expect 291 to show up. So no wonder if I sell, if I have 300 seats, I should have plenty of room for everybody that I expect to show up. So there's only a 1.98% chance that more than 300 people show up. Now, let's say that you actually went and did the math for all of these things, right? I mean, it would take a little bit of time. You'd have to do all these calculations. I mean, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get exactly 1.98. You're going to get a number close to it. And um, I'm about to kind of explain why in a second for that. But you hopefully will get a number fairly close to that, but it's not exact because you're doing two different things. Here I'm using the normal model. Here I'm using a binomial model. They're two different models. Now, a binomial and a normal model, the bigger the sample size, so if n is big, I could actually go ahead and say that the normal model and the binomial model will be very similar when n is big. That's why when I was only working with um, 12 tickets, it wasn't big enough, but working with 310 tickets, it is big enough. So the idea here is if you want to use the normal model, to use normal model, okay, you have to expect 10 successes or more, or more, sorry for my bad handwriting, and you have to expect 10 failures or more, okay? 
So in this example with the flying, I had 310 tickets sold times 0.94. So that was 94% of people that are going to show up. That was 291.4. So obviously more than 10 successes. And if I would do 310 times 0.06, I get 18 people that don't show up. So again, that was more than 10 successes and more than 10 failures. If I go back to this previous problem up here, where I had 12 tickets times 0.94, that was 11.28 people I expect to show up. If I would do 12 times 0.06, I get only 0.72. I mean, the opposite of this, right? If I sell 12 tickets, that would be 0.72 people that don't show. So I, I don't even expect a full person to not show, and that's why the probability was so high here, but that's not bigger than 10. I need 10 successes and 10 failures. So in order to use the normal model, I need n times p, right? n times p is your successes. I need 10 of those or more, and I need n times q, your failures. I need 10 of those or more as well. So in a problem like this where I have so many people, 310, the normal model and the binomial model are going to be fairly close to the same, and I could do it. Problem like this, I couldn't use the normal model because I don't have enough people. I'd have to trust my, bon my, my bo binomial model, which is what I did right here. But again, only doing two calculations is pretty easy. Hopefully that makes sense to you here. I had to do a lot more, and I didn't want to do that. All right, let's look at another problem that's not the binomial model, and I want to talk about how we could find expected values if it's not binomial. It means it's not just um, success or failure. It's a little bit different problem, and it's kind of neat. Okay, a carnival game costs $2 to play. You have to throw a dart and hit a balloon about 10 feet away. You believe that you have a 20% chance of hitting the balloon on any given throw. You are willing to play the game, sorry for the typo there, you're willing to play the game three times. How many darts do you expect to throw and how much money do you expect to win? So there's two different problems here. How many darts do I expect to throw? How much money do I expect to win? So let's do darts first. Okay, this is a pretty cool problem actually. I think it'll make a lot of sense to you. So first off, x is the random variable of how many darts I'm going to throw. Well, I'm going to play the game three times. So I could throw one dart, two darts, or three darts. And I need to find the probability of each. And that's the probability that the darts I throw equals the each individual outcome. So the little x is just each individual outcome. So what has to happen for me to throw one dart? Well, if I throw one dart and win the first time, I'm done. I'm happy. I'm done. So what's the probability to throw one dart and win? 0 0.20. The probability of you throwing the dart and winning, 20%. Okay? So that's easy. That's done. What's going to happen for me to throw two darts? Well, for me to throw two darts, I must have missed the first time, hence why I'm throwing a second dart. So that'd be 0 0.8 times 0 0.2. Sorry for not having the zeros there. Okay, so that'd be 80% I missed the first time, and then I make it on the second dart. That's why it took me two darts to throw. Now, let's get a calculation on that. 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 is 0.16. Okay, now the next option is three darts. That means I could miss twice in a row and then I find success. So I miss twice in a row, two misses, and then on the third, to third toss of the dart, I finally win the prize. All right, or if you think about it though, there's another option here. I could miss all three times. Miss, miss, miss. I'm so unhappy. I'm done. I don't want to play the game anymore. So with throwing three darts, there's two options. Miss, miss, make it. Okay, I'm happy. Or miss, 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 0.8 to the third. So I'd have to figure out both of those options and add them together. So it'd be 0.8 to the second times 0.2 or plus 0.8 to the third. And let's see here. I want to make sure I typed it all in right. 0.64. 0.64. So I have a 20% chance of throwing one dart, 16% chance of throwing two darts, and a 64% chance of throwing three darts. Why is that so high? Because again, you only got a 20% chance of hitting it, so realistically, you probably aren't going to hit it right away. So now to find the, pro the expected value, to find the expected number of darts, here's what you have to do. You have to take the first option, which is one dart, times it by its probability, plus the second option, two darts, times by its probability, plus the third option, three darts, times 
its probability. So one dart times its probability plus two darts times its probability plus three darts times its probability, and that's how you find your expected value. So it would be one times 0 0.20 plus two times 0.16 plus three times 0.64. So I expect to throw 2.44 darts. So that's the answer to the question. I expect to throw 2.44 darts. And again, why is it so high? Well, again, I only got a 20% chance of winning. All right, now let's do how much money I expect to win. So let's do money now. How much money I expect to win. Now remember, charge $2 and, uh, oh, I never put it up here. I guess I forgot to add in there. Sorry. If you win the game, I should have put it in the directions. If you win the game, you get $5. If you win the game, you get $5. Okay, so let's just say that you win on the very first toss. Very first toss, you win. Well, how much money do you actually win? Well, you spent $2, you won 5 so technically, if you won on the very first toss, you won $3. And what would be the probability of that happening? Well, I'm going to kind of, in a way, correspond it to my dart things over here. That'd be throwing one dart, winning it right away, spent 2 won 5 that's a total increase of $3, and that would be 20% chance, right? Now, if it takes me two darts, that means it's going to cost me $4 to play. And if I win on the second toss, I really only win a dollar because it costs me four to play. Five is how much I win, so I win a dollar. And we already figured that out as 0.16. That would be lose, win, 0.8 times 0.2. Now, this third option actually has two different things can happen. If I, if I play t three times but do win, that means I spent $6.00 and I won five, so that's negative one dollar, negative one dollar. So that would be 0.8 squared for my two losses times 0.2, so that'd be 0 0.128, 0 0.128. So let me just kind of show you what that looks like again. So that'd be lose twice, finally win. So that's, again, three times, six dollars, win five, that's why I'm lo technically losing a dollar. Now, the last option is I lose all three times. So I never once win. That means I lost $6 because I lost, 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 spent six, 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 right? Six dollars, two, two, two. And that would be 0.8 to the third. It's just 0.512. Now, over here, we combined those last two because it was three darts, no matter how you looked at it. Here, it's separate because it actually represents money. So to find the expected amount of money, I'm going to have to do, okay, to find the expected amount of money for me to win, I'm going to do 3 times 0 0.20 plus 1 times 0.16 plus negative 1 times 0.128 plus, and I'm running out of room, so I'm going to come down here a little bit, negative 6 times 0.512. So I got 3 times 0.20 plus 1 times 0.16 plus negative 1 times 0.128 plus negative 6 times 0.512. So let me make sure I got all these in there right. 3 times 0.2, 1 times 0.16, negative 1 times 0.12, 8. Okay, good. So I expect to lose, I expect to lose negative $2.44. Now, does that have anything to do with the darts? I'm a little bit kind of, uh, I don't say, um, s uh, astonished, but it's not always going to turn out to be the same like that. It's just kind of weird that it happened that way. But I expect to lose two, I mean, if I would have picked that you win $7, there's no way it would have been the same. But anyway, you expect to lose $2.44. Why do you expect to lose? Well, because you only got a 20% chance of winning the game in the first place. So think about it. You probably will lose anyway. So um, hopefully that makes sense in terms of that. And I do want to do one more problem so this all makes sense. Another problem where there's many outcomes. I'm just trying to show there's different outcomes, how you'd figure this out. So let's say that um, you own a computer, and sometimes computers need repairs. So in any given year, in one year, you are told to expect zero repairs 50% of the time. So that's a good thing, right? 50% of the time, you're going to have no repairs. Um, you're going to need one repair 25% of the time. 
two repairs within the year, 15% of the time, three repairs, 10% of the time. Now, these do need to add up to 100% of the time, and they do. If they don't add up to 100%, something's going on. All right, so if I want to say, hey, find the expected number of repairs. Again, I don't know how many repairs I'm going to need. It's random, which is why we're calling it X. It's a random variable. I don't know how many I'm going to need. Could need 0, 1, 2, 3, or, uh, 0, 1, 2, or 3. I'm never going to need 4, obviously, because this is 100%. So to find your expected value, you do 0 times 0 0.50 plus 1 times 0 0.25 plus 2 times 0 0.15 plus 3 times 0 0.10. It's as simple as that. So 0 times 0 0.50 plus 1 times 0 0.25 plus 2 times 0 0.15 plus 3 times 0 0.10, I will expect 0.85 repairs. Now, you may say, wait a minute, that's not even a repair. That doesn't even make sense. Well, it's an expected value, okay? Obviously, um, you don't, obviously, this is just expected. It's like an average, you know what I mean? It's what we expect, all right? Now, obviously, there, that, you know, there is going to be a standard deviation attached to this, and I am going to teach you how to find that, but the formula is pretty confusing, and I'm, it's not as simple as the square root of NPQ because that's for binomial, and I will teach the formula to you in class, but right now, you don't have to worry about it. Actually, we're going to let the calculator do it for us for the most part, but anyway, that's how you find expected variables, okay, or expected values. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense to you guys. Um, and, you know, understand that if I was going to do this for two years, this was just in one year, right? What about two years? Well, in two years, though, well, if, if, if I expect 0.85 repairs in one year, then I'm going to do add another 0.85. So in two years, I expect 1.7 repairs. It'd be 0.85 times two. Now, again, this is all assuming independence. This is all assuming that one repair will not necessarily lead to more. Is that true? I don't know. You know, so you guys know computers. Sometimes one thing crashes and it causes another thing to crash. Next thing you know, you have 20 repairs that are needed. But we do have to assume in this case that that's not true, that one, um, the outcome of one thing is not going to impact the next. So hopefully this all makes sense to you guys. The most important part I really want you to understand is like these two problems right here with expected values. Obviously, this problem with Bailey should make, just make a ton of sense. I mean, 80%, 10 free throws, 10 times 80%, 8 free throws made, and then there's that standard deviation formula as well. And then when we're talking about here, you know, hopefully these problems make sense in terms of expected values. And the idea of using the normal model to save us all the time from doing all this work is just awesome. I and mean, this normal model is great, but you got to be careful. You need your expected values, mean, and standard deviation. Then you just do Z scores like we would anything else. The other issue is you have to make sure if you are going to use the normal model, you need 10 successes and 10 failures. So again, we were talking up here, you know, that would be I need 10 people to show, more than 10 people to show, and I also need more than 10 people to not show. So that's why we would have to check that by doing 310 times 94%, we got 291.4, and then 310 times 6% is where we get the 18.6. So we were going to have 10 or more failures and 10 or more successes. So hopefully this problem makes a lot of sense if you need to watch it again and kind of go through in your head that could help you and there is a problem very similar to this one in your homework um, so hopefully I've provided enough information to you to help you out and we'll have that test when we come back from break and enjoy